statement. Well, uh, gentlemen, the occasion, of course, is the naming of the first Apollo flight crew. Now, the uh, crewmen will be uh, Lieutenant Colonel Virgil Gus Grissom, Lieutenant Colonel Edward H. White, and Lieutenant Roger B. Chaffee. Now, I think uh, you all know all these, these gentlemen. I'm not going to identify the rest of the people here on the stage, at the moment anyway. Uh, of course, uh, Gus Grissom made the second flight in the Mercury program. That was M MR4 back in July 61, I believe it was. And uh, he was the first of the astronauts to make two space flights, being uh, the command pilot in the, the first Gemini crew, uh, Gemini uh, number three. And now he will be the uh, commander of the first Apollo flight mission. And I think that uh, must be obvious to everyone that, that early in these programs, it's very important to have our coolest and oldest heads in the business. Old. <laughs> and, uh, I mean old only in the point of experience, Gus. Of course, you know uh, uh, Ed White, he's become a pretty famous man in the last year, and I believe this will be uh, Roger Chafee's first space flight, and, and of course, we wish all these men uh, extremely well. Now, the backups, or the backup crew would be uh, Lieutenant Colonel James McDevitt, uh, Major David Scott, who is at the center right now, but is not able to be here, and Mr. Russell L. Schweikert of NASA. The far end of the table, as you may have guessed by now, is, is Joe Shea, the uh, manager of the uh, Apollo program. I think uh, it would be appropriate <laughs> At this time, maybe to ask Gus for a few words. Well, I didn't know I was going to have to say anything today. <laughs> uh, well, I'm real pleased to be on the first flight and looking forward to it. I've just now started getting into the uh, Apollo systems and looking at Apollo spacecraft and trying to forget everything I knew about Gemini. I think we've got a real good crew with, uh, with Ed and Roger. And then with uh, Jim and, and Rusty and, and uh, Dave Scott backing us up, well, I think we've got a good crew. We'll have a good flight. Mm -hmm. Oscar, is anything? Speak, Ed. No, I'm, I'm quite pleased to be named on the uh, first Apollo flight. As you might know, when we came in here, we were assigned and worked primarily in the Apollo area until we were uh, fortunate enough to get, till I was fortunate enough to get pulled off and uh, get to fly Gemini, and it's nice to be uh, back in working in Apollo. We uh, are working in the systems right now, getting up to speed, and I think uh, we'll all be looking forward to the flight. Roger? I've been working in the Apollo system since I joined NASA about two years ago, and needless to say, I'm extremely excited about being named to this flight crew, and I think I've got a couple of the greatest men in the world to work with. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Joe, would you look? No, I don't have much to say. It's just kind of a, a pleasure to finally get some men in the manned space part of Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> this unmanned part of the program has been going on a little bit too long. Uh, I got one minor bone to pick with Gus. Uh, since Apollo is derived very heavily from Mercury and Gemini, and we rely uh, extremely much on that experience, I don't really want him to forget what he's learned in Gemini, <laughs> but rather to bring it with him, and I suspect that's really what he's going to do. Uh, I'm not going to forget the bad things. <laughs> <laughs> you keep telling me there weren't any. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, 
Well, I, I think it's it's a great crew. I think that uh, that, that Gus has shown he's a, he's a good commander, and uh, I look forward to the whole Apollo team working with these guys and beginning what I hope will be a long and successful Apollo flight schedule. Joe, I'm sure they'd appreciate some uh, indication of the extent of the experiments to be carried in the first flight or any particular maneuver. Seeing Ed White here might raise questions about EVA. No, we... Uh, for Ed's benefit, the uh, hatch will be firmly closed in the <laughs> Apollo. We don't open the hatch until block two. Uh, the mission itself uh, is something a little different uh, for a first manned flight than we've done before. Uh, the mission is, uh, there are two missions like this in the block one part of the program. Uh, the prime purpose of the mission is to really exercise the spacecraft and the crews in Earth orbit. As you recognize that we will have had only two relatively short flights, the one that we had uh, last month and the upcoming flight 202 that will be uh, sometime this summer. The uh, uh, first mission, however, rather than restricting it to any arbitrary number of orbits uh, before the mission starts, will be what uh, we would call an open-ended mission. The intent is to make, in effect, a series of decisions uh, for the first six orbits, essentially a decision each orbit that the spacecraft is operating properly and is therefore go. I think you're aware after about six orbits, there's a fairly major commitment then, hopefully for a, a long period of time. And uh, we would then, after about the first six orbits, expect to make go decisions uh, roughly once a day. The intent is to exercise the systems as long as they keep operating properly. Uh, recognizing that uh, on a first flight like this, uh, some problems might come up, and that's really why we're flying, flying the flight. Uh, everything working properly, we might go uh, oh, 12 to 14 days in the, in the limit on the mission. As far as the experiments are concerned, uh, they'll be primarily uh, medical experiments uh, on the first mission. I think there are some 10. Total, most of these have been done in the uh, Gemini program, and these are repeats of them because this would be, if it went all the way, one of the, uh, the longer missions that we've run. I'd just like to, to make quite clear that, that uh, this first man flight will not necessarily be on number 204. It could be very well be on 204, but it only will be if, if the intervening events are, are such that that we uh, are able to to do that. That's right. All right, gentlemen, do you have questions? Ben? Did we have uh, Lieutenant Spacey's pilot? Navy Lieutenant. No, no, I mean, uh, we have <laughs> pilot, oh, I'm uh, command pilot, uh, pilot, oh. and... <laughs> well, I was... Uh, <laughs> yes, the nation's cast. Yes, the boss. Well, we, we really haven't come up with the name for the positions yet. Uh, I think uh, tentatively we've sort of looked at it as being a, a command pilot, senior pilot, and pilot role, but we haven't officially designated the positions at this time. John? Uh, any indication when this uh, flight will take place? First quarter. It's presently scheduled for the first quarter of 67. Assuming it's on 204. Uh, well, which one is the navigator, the senior pilot or the pilot? I, I think the uh, reason why we haven't designated any person as the navigator or a systems engineer as uh, we have somewhat in the past worked along these lines is that it's really a three-man operation, and uh, there won't be any one person doing the navigation nor any one person doing strictly the systems. They'll have people that uh, will be up for a period of time while one of the crew members will be sleeping. So you can see that you obviously can't have somebody sitting in the commander's seat, the same man the whole flight. It'll be uh, swapping around, so there'll be a uh, navigator, and he'll be all three men. All three men will be fully qualified navigators, systems engineers saying that you'll be cross-trained to be able to step into anybody's or sit into anybody's that's, seat. That's right. right. That's the only way you can do it when you have to realize one man has to be down uh, sleeping for some of the period of time when two men are up, roughly a six to eight hour period. Thank you. Uh, will there be any rendezvous practice on this mission? No rendezvous planned on this one at this time. 
Uh, unlike Gemini, therefore, uh, one of the crew members will be awake at all times. We plan to have one crew member awake all the time. I realize that this isn't a flight to the moon, but if it were, which two men would go down to the surface of the moon? Which two men you would uh, go into the limb? I'm not sure. I'm sure this had been resolved at this the, time. Uh, I don't think the, the, if, if, the if planning office. If it was this crew, I would be me and somebody else. Are they, are they all medical experiments, Dr. Shea, or are you having any scientific and engineering type? Let's see. I there guess are there are two minor, there are two uh, scientific uh, experiments on board, uh, uh, photographing weather and uh, land masses, and, and I believe there's uh, one other technical one. The nephilometer. The nephilometer, that's right. Oh, that's for the inside of the spacecraft. Yeah. That's right. The rest of them are medical. What is, what is that? I can't even pronounce it. What is it? <laughs> it measures nephils. <laughs> <laughs> it at, at, uh, essentially measures the uh, dust particles in the space. Uh, nephil is a Greek word for clouds or something <laughs> like that. And it measures the dustiness or the opacity of the atmosphere in the cabin. The turbidity. Turbidity is the right thing. <laughs> rest of Nice to have smart guys on the cruise. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can predict right now that most of the jokes will come about the nephilometer. <laughs> Is your, uh, is your planning far enough advanced that you know how high up you'll be on this flight? Yeah, the initial, the initial injection is in orbit uh, 100 and, or excuse me, 85 perigee by about 130. It'll be circularized. Then there are a number of burns, uh, seven or eight on the service module engine, since that's one of the major things that we're checking out. And uh, we may get up to as high as 200, 235 miles thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, since, since Mr. Shea has indicated that uh, he realizes that some problems might occur on an open-ended flight, will uh, the recovery forces be more extensive in the Apollo program than they have been in Gemini? No, I don't think so. We would plan to use the same recovery areas. My impression is they've worked out pretty well, even in uh, somewhat emergency situations. <coughs> Dr. Shea, could you give us a rundown then on, on, the, on the flight plan for that mission? What will, you, what will be primarily important on the first manned mission and secondary objectives and things like that? It's, I'd prefer not to do it in, in nauseating detail. Basically, the, uh, the primary things we're doing is, is uh, literally uh, engineering experimentation on the spacecraft. That's one reason why the number of other experiments are so small. Uh, we want to do a number of burns on the service module engine of various degrees, uh, see how it operates after it's uh, been soaked uh, in space, reached equilibrium cold temperatures, uh, see what minimum impulse we can get out of it because we have to trade off between the reaction control system and the uh, service module engine and some of the lunar parts of the mission. We'll be doing, uh, using the guidance and navigation system, which as you know contains uh, both a scanning telescope and a sextant, and we'll be seeing how well we can determine uh, from Earth orbit uh, the uh, trajectory of the uh, spacecraft. Uh, also seeing uh, from low Earth orbital altitudes how well we can shoot stars with things like the, uh, the sextant, uh, and by and large working out the, the accuracies, if you will, of the guidance and navigation system. In most of the, most of the other systems, uh, we will have on board the uh, S-band communication system. It will be backed up with a uh, VHF communication system of the kind that we have been using, and this will be the first flight of the S-Band. We'll be qualifying it for uh, follow-on missions, both Earth orbital and lunar, and I think you know on the uh, follow-on Apollo missions, we will use uh, for almost all the communications at lunar ranges what we call the unified S-Band equipment, which provides uh, not just communications, but also the uh, tracking necessary for uh, for determining orbits from the ground. In the uh, area of the thermal control system, we have a number of problems that we 
are interested in, primarily involved in the behavior of the spacecraft uh, under various thermal conditions, uh, how effective the radiators are, uh, under what conditions we wind up boiling water, and we'll be putting the spacecraft into a series of, of uh, fixed attitudes for fixed periods of time under various power loads in order to, uh, to observe uh, the radiator and overall thermal efficiency of the system. Uh, the other subsystems, uh, stabilization and control, there are a number of modes of operation in stabilization and control. We'll be playing with those uh, in order to determine how effective they are in the space operations itself. Uh, setting up various of the inline uh, uh, nominal and emergency situations for all of the systems. We have a, a large number of redundant systems on the spacecraft and we want to exercise them in essentially uh, most of the permutations and combinations we'd expect to see on the, uh, on the lunar flights. Uh, that will take a fair part of the time. Um, by and large, uh, then a very detailed exercising of the spacecraft systems uh, in order to mm. be sure that things operate as they have been designed. In certain instances, getting some on-orbit design information which we'll use for the Block II and later spacecraft flights. Uh, how about the reentry speeds? What uh, reentry patterns are you looking towards? Uh, speeds? And no, we'll just be coming in normal Earth orbit reentry conditions. This will not be anything like we've been doing on 201 or 202. Uh, will there be a uh, real-time uh, TV? So uh, I believe there will be real-time TV. Well, let, excuse me, there will be TV available from the spacecraft. How it works into real-time, I will not uh, commit to at this point <laughs> in time. We have a switch. <laughs> there might be a, an embarrassing moment or two. The uh, yeah. cool producer in this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Has a decision uh, been made, Joe, on what suits the uh, crew will wear? Yeah, we're using the uh, the Gemini suit. I forget the exact uh, model number or cut, but it. Uh, no, it's not the lightweight suit. Standard Gemini suit. Standard Gemini. It's called the A1C, and it's not. It's the basically the G4C with a few minor modifications, such as the position is a stand-up position in it primarily, and there's a modification there so you can stand up more comfortably. The shoulders are a little bit. Uh, <laughs> more designed for uh, optimum mobility. Basically, it's a G4C suit. <laughs> Dr. Gilruth, would you absolutely rule out the possibility of this flight this year? Oh, I wouldn't uh, uh, like to say any more than that. If it goes on 204, it's scheduled for the first quarter next year. I, I wouldn't like to be categoric about anything they say. Uh, I have a question on, on the orbital parameters. Will you be launching on the same azimuth heading and using the same tracking station? And when will you change over, et cetera? I believe we are launching on essentially the same orbits, and uh, it's pretty much it'll look pretty much like a Gemini flight from the uh, from the flight control point of view, except for the the new systems involved and the different telemetry formats and so on. Somewhat larger delta V on board the spacecraft. That. When will your uh, your uh, tracking station, the three tracking stations that will be able to follow the uh, trajectory all the way oh. to the moon, when will, will they come into commission? Oh, they will gradually come into commission uh, during this year and next year, but recognize they're only for deep space operations. What we've done is outfit most of the existing uh, uh, manned spaceflight stations that have been used in Mercury and Gemini with S-band equipment, and they're used primarily for the Earth orbital part of the operation. It's only when you get out to ranges of, oh, 10,000 miles or more that you're far enough away to come back to use just the three stations located around the Earth. Uh, I assume you'll be spending the rest of the year strictly on Apollo. What are going to be some of the first things uh, you're going to be doing in your training? Well, the training will go pretty much as it did in Gemini. We'll spend a great deal of time with the spacecraft. And then as our uh, Apollo mission simulator uh, comes into being, why, of course, we'll, we'll do the major portion of our training there. When do you expect to have the simulator ready? Uh, I don't know the new date, but it, it should be within uh, a month, six weeks, I think, starting the work. First part of May. 
be very little difference in training for this Apollo flight than training for a Gemini flight, except different equipment. Different equipment, right. Perhaps on the first flight will be a little more emphasis on systems uh, review. Uh, and those, the systems are a little more complex, so it's going to take a little more time to do them, learn them. This is what we've been doing today. As a matter of fact, we were in a briefing on the service propulsion system and the command module RCS system all day. Steve, uh, go ahead. Uh, let me ask two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, when Gus, uh, did you and, and White and uh, Chaffee know of your selection yourselves? And the uh, second question is, is the planning date also within the third quarter, or first quarter of 67, or is the planning date earlier? I assume you have a, a planning date you're working toward. Well, uh, officially, uh, we found out about it today. Uh, you don't, can't feel comfortable about it until everybody's been told. <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I don't think I understood the second part of your question. Well, let's go back to the first question, and uh, I'll ask you unofficially when you knew about it. Well, uh, I, uh, I don't know when it was. Some time ago. Some time ago, I don't know. A month, maybe? Uh, I really, I really don't know. I don't know if it was a month or six weeks ago when it was. But I've known about it for a while. So all of us have. Okay. Now, what about the uh, the planning date? Is it within the first quarter of '67, or is it some other time, such as earlier? The planning date for the launch. For the launch, yes. First quarter of '67. There is a date within the first quarter of '67 that has been given to you as the planning date for the. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, launch date is, is when the, when all of it gets ready to go on a, a date that's sort of scheduled. Doesn't mean anything to me. Well, I'm not you know I'm not asking whether it means anything to you now. I'm just asking you whether it. Uh, well, I'm telling you that I that it doesn't mean enough to me for for me to go look it up and see what it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, to be precise, there is not a date set because uh, on a first mission like this, uh, there are a number of things that have to fall into place from the delivery and checkout of the spacecraft through the training of the crews. And, and this far away from the possible flight, we can't set a date. So we don't bother even to write it down on paper. So Gus couldn't find it if he wanted to look it up. Uh, so the flight will come sometime in the first quarter of 67 or when everything is ready. Uh, Mr. Shea, uh, where is the Apollo uh, and where is the Saturn for the 204 at this time? Well, let's see. The Apollo, I know, it's uh, in North American uh, Downey plant. The command module is in what we call pressure test at the present time and a pressure cell. The service module is uh, in a building we call 290, which is the main checkout <coughs> building, getting some tanks changed before it goes into pressure test. Uh, I presume that the uh, 204 first stage is down at Michoud someplace getting built, and that the second stage, the S-4B, is somewhere in a Douglas plant or up at Sacto uh, getting uh, either built or checked out. Steve. Dr. Gilruth, uh, I noticed that you've not yet named a crew for Gemini 12. Is there a chance that Gemini 12 will not fly, that you'll go right into the Apollo program from Gemini, Gemini 11? No, I think not. I think there's every uh, expectation of flying Gemini 12. Pete Baldwin right here. Uh, how would the uh, gross weight of the first spacecraft, the 204 spacecraft, compare with uh, the first lunar mission spacecraft, with the entire spacecraft, including yeah. the service module? Um, we usually break gross weight down in two parts. If you talk about the the dry weight, which would be the weight of the command module with everything in it, including its reaction control system, propellants, and life support, and that sort of junk. And the service module without any propellants in it, because that's the big variable part in the service module, then the gross weights are roughly the same uh, within a few hundred pounds of what we'd expect for the lunar operation. Uh, the vehicle will carry in the service module uh, Oh, probably uh, 12 to 13,000 pounds of fuel, perhaps a little bit more, 
compared to around 38,000 pounds of fuel, which would be the nominal load for a lunar mission. Okay, the, the all-up weight of the spacecraft then on top of the uh, uh, S-1B is uh, something around 34 to 35,000 pounds. The actual weights will be determined later on when we refine our calculations on both the S-4B performance and uh, how much we actually weigh as we put ourselves on the scales. Uh, Dr. Gilruth, has a proposal been made to possibly scrub Gemini 12 and uh, if so, has a final decision yet been made on that? To my knowledge, no proposal, such proposal has been made and <coughs> there's every uh, expectation of flying Gemini 12. Proposals then, is, are there any plans, and I mean loose plans, perhaps considerations to rendezvous 12 with the uh, 204? There's been some uh, uh, studying of these possibilities, but there are no plans uh, this time for, for doing that. What would be the purpose? Just a rendezvous exercise? Well, uh, there are many purposes. Uh, it's, it's always nice to have somebody uh, able to uh, take a look at you in space to see how you look uh, if you've come through the launch without any scars and this sort of thing. There, there, there are some, some reasons why project people on Apollo would like to have uh, Gemini pilots be able to station keep with them and, and look them over. Uh, whether or not this proves to be feasible is uh, certainly is not in the plans at this time. There, all I'm saying is there's been some studying and discussion of this as we study and discuss many, many things in these programs. Is, along that same line, is this studying and consideration still underway? I couldn't uh, answer that question really because uh, uh, there are many people <coughs> working on these programs and, and uh, of course they, uh, they study many things and I don't know all the things they study every day. Maybe Dr. Shea has <laughs> some comments on this. He's a little closer to it than I am. Yeah, there's still a lot of people study under me too though. <laughs> uh, uh, the studying is still going on. At, uh, it is much too early to say whether we decide we really need to do it or not. Uh, gentlemen, why don't we take about a five minute break. These gentlemen have to go back. I know Dr. Gilruth was pulled out of a meeting. Then we'll resume the normal briefing. We have some other material to cover. Thank you. Thank you.